Hi everyone, my name is Philip Hamilton. Monica, Mariana, and I are going to talk to you about the database of identified North Atlantic right whales that we, with the help of six others, maintain at the New England Aquarium. This database is called the North Atlantic Right Whale Catalog and has taught us much of what we know about the species. There's a lot to say about the catalog. This video will only scratch the surface, but we hope it will give you a good sense of this powerful tool. And you can always go to the catalog website to learn more. My personal journey with right whales began in 1986 when I was hired by the Center for Coastal Studies fresh out of college without ever having seen a whale. 34 years later, I'm a research scientist with the aquarium where I manage the right whale catalog. As you'll notice if you watch this series of videos from our team, many of us were captivated by right whales early in our careers and have stayed with them ever since. It's really easy to get hooked by these intriguing and complex animals. They're just struggling to survive in our increasingly urban oceans. So what is the catalog? It's a record of all the photographed right whale sightings from 1935 to the present, at least all that we know of. Because we can use the natural markings visible in these photographs, especially on the whale's heads, to distinguish one whale from another, it allows us to keep track of them throughout their lives. Each whale gets a catalog number for reference, and some also get names. The catalog provides us with such basic but essential information as how many there are, currently just over 350 alive out of the 762 in the catalog, how often they reproduce, as frequently as three years, but can be as long as 10 years or more, the age at which they can give birth, which is 10 years on average, their survival, and how often they've been scarred by fishing ropes or ship's propellers. The ability to recognize individuals has taught us that the whales that give birth off of Florida and Georgia are the same ones seen off New England and Eastern Canada. And that, and that while most right whales remain close to the Eastern seaboard, some take really interesting walkabouts. Like Porter, an adult male first seen in 1981, who in 1999 swam to the northern tip of Norway and back to Cape Cod, huge distance. Or Mogul, another adult male, who over a two year period swam from Cape Cod to Iceland, back to Cape Cod, then all the way over to France and then to Newfoundland. These journeys excite my imagination because we only know about them because someone took a photograph in these far flung places and also knew to send it to us. How many more interesting and unexpected journeys are these animals taking that we never learn about? The catalog is an extraordinary collaborative effort. While we at the aquarium collect many right whale sightings, the bulk of the photographs each year come from organizations, from other organizations and individuals and their contributions make it all possible. Monica is gonna tell you more about how all these data get to us at the aquarium. Hi. I'm Monica Zani and I want to pick up where Philip left off. Philip explained what the catalog is and why it's important and how it helps us better understand right whale life history. One of my roles here on the right whale team is as the data coordinator. So I want to tell you a little bit more about that and how we get all of these sightings contributed to the catalog. Now that's about 3,000 a year. Right whale sightings come in many forms. By far the cleanest data come from dedicated survey teams, both shipboard and aerial. And these teams all follow a submission protocol that we've created. However, we also receive many opportunistic sightings, which come in a wide array of platforms, such as whale watch boats, charter boats, cruise ships, harbor pilots, news helicopters, surfers, and even folks walking along the beach. The sighting of Porter and Mogo came from opportunistic sources. Most of these sightings are reported to the Coast Guard or various sighting hotlines or from the Whale Alert app, and they're funneled to me via a network of agencies that operate those. However, as you can imagine, many sightings in recent years appear only on social media platforms. Luckily, those sightings often come to us in the form of a friend of a friend of a friend sent this to me. But it still takes a lot of time to track down the original images or video and the location data for each of those sightings. We typically receive over 100 opportunistic sightings from the general public each and every year. Once all the images and data are in hand, we're ready to upload them into the database. Now, Mariana is going to describe that process more for you. Hey, everyone. 
I'm Mariana Hagblum, and I'm a research assistant who loves to work on the catalog, which is a good thing because the majority of my time is dedicated to curating it. So after the data are sent to us, as Monica explained, we enter each sighting into a database using specialized computer software called Digits. We scour every photo so we can assign information to the sighting based on the physical features seen in the photos. The main feature we code for is the callosity, but other features are also really important, like scars, whether the underside of the whale has white pigmentation or is all black, and even things like if the flukes are drooping. Some other information like behavior is entered into the sighting, and eventually the sighting moves into the matching stage when someone looks at the images in the sighting and compares them to the catalog to determine which individual they're looking at. Once they've found the match, a different person on our team will look at it and double check that it's correct. Then it's officially added to the catalog in that whale's portfolio. Matching a sighting to an individual can be thrilling, like solving a difficult puzzle. Sometimes a sighting will remain unmatched for years. This might be because the whale was last seen as a tiny calf before its identifying features were fully formed, or because the photos show few or previously undocumented features. I actually keep a folder on my computer with photos of whales that I've put a lot of effort into matching, but I haven't solved yet. So when I finally get to delete a folder because one of these whales has been matched, it feels amazing, whether I or someone else on the team matched it. But sometimes matching a tough sighting is bittersweet. When a whale is found dead at sea, we usually have very few features to work with because the whale is belly up or on its side. But we have matched carcasses to the catalog with the smallest bits of information sometimes literally a teeny tiny scar that the photographer probably didn't even think was worth the photo. Once the sightings have been matched to whales in the catalog, our understanding of the biology of the species deepens. Each identification refines our knowledge of age at sexual maturity, how frequently they calve, individual survival, and so on. And because we've been cataloging these whales for over 40 years, we're able to detect changes over time, like the recent increase in the age at which females give birth to their first calf, or past mothers delaying when they give birth to their next calf. These identifications are also vital to other research efforts, such as hormone studies, growth measurements, and genetic assessment. By knowing who the whale is, data from these studies can be linked to known age, sex, reproductive status, past injuries, and even habitat use pattern. In short, knowing the individual gives us the information necessary to conserve the species. And this is why we feel so much passion for the work we do. We hope this video gives you a better understanding of the backbone of the right whale research team. Check back to the aquarium's website for other videos about the right whale team. And don't forget to check the catalog website at rwcatalog.neaq.org. Thank <laughs> you.